Charlene, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Really appreciate it. I know Mondays are, you said your day off. Yeah, Mondays. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that, that's what we call it, is yeah, day yeah, I off. Know. <laughs> I stuff it up with as many things as I possibly can, you know, yeah. personal and still business. Yeah. Um, we now close actually Sunday and Monday because... Okay. Monday used to be just it, and uh, I just couldn't get it done. I'd yeah. be so upset on Monday night, not getting everything finished and knowing that it just had to wait another week. And um, when actually when COVID happened, when we started kind of reopening slowly between being closed and takeout and, and then getting the restaurant going again, we closed. We just stayed closed on Sunday, Monday. I wanted yeah. to have um, just full-time staff. I didn't want to, because when you are open six days, and that's what we've always done, um, you have to kind of piece it together with part-time staff as well. You can't sure. have everybody working six days or you're paying a lot of overtime. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, we're going to stay with five. And I've just decided that I like it that way. Yeah. I nice. still managed to stuff enough stuff into Sunday as well. Sure. So. <laughs> well, I was joking a little bit on my, the day off. There is no day off in this, in this yeah. industry. You Not know? in the restaurant business. No, um, no. You know, there's, there's payroll. I mean, I try to be cooking in my kitchen. And, and uh, so the day off is paying bills and keeping up with stuff and answering emails and um, making sure that you've done everything that you possibly can do so that you can cook for the next five days. Yeah. Yeah. That's very key. We're, we're, I'm, I don't want to say we, uh, me personally, I think Luke, you're more organized than me, but mm, I'm starting to realize I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to realize, right. You get that, you know, you get all your stuff ready for, you know, the week and just the smallest little things. And, uh, it can really pay dividends, you know, uh, especially when you're in a chaotic type of atmosphere. Right. Cause you know? there is no guarantee. It's like, okay, we start Tuesday and you're going along and the ice machine doesn't work or yeah. something didn't come in or you're going to have to change this or you got to print the menus and the ink is out. I mean, it could be anything. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> used the last of the paper, or, you know, somebody used the last of something else, whatever it is. And yeah. you weren't planning on that. So it's kind of good to be in the kind of the right mindset as organized as possible. Yeah. Because something isn't going to go the way it should have. Right. Yeah, it's just right. the way it is. <laughs> well, where are you? Uh, are, are you originally from Arizona? I am. I'm originally okay. from Tucson. Okay. That's Excellent. Right. Well, what was the what food involved with your, with your growing up? Um, not a whole lot. No? I mean, okay. we obviously ate food. Sure. <laughs> like everybody else. <laughs> that is one else. thing we all have in common, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We ate. We grew. <laughs> um, you know, I, I always, though, was kind of interested in it. I, was, um, I started in a program in high school. Uh, that would get you a job in a restaurant. I wanted, but I, it wasn't because I was passionate about food. I wanted to buy a car. Okay. And I tell people that. <laughs> I didn't, my parents didn't take me to Paris and I didn't have foie gras when I was seven and decided yeah. I wanted to be a chef and started cooking omelets and that didn't, that never happened. Yeah. I would look, you know, I'd sit at the dinner table and be like, I really would like to make something better than this. Um, I mean, and a lot of it is capped off by, how much money, you know, mom and dad were bringing in sure. and things like that. How yeah. many of us there were, all of those things. How much yeah. time there's involved in making a meal. Um, like most people. And I used to be like, I, I really want to learn how to cook. But I also wanted a car. So yeah. that was, <laughs> what car were you looking at? I bought a Camaro. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> An old one. And then by the time I was 18, I bought another Camaro. And I wish somebody, I mean, I was just talking about it recently. I wish somebody would have said, you know, you're 18 years old. You do not need two Camaros. <laughs> you can only want, drive one car at yeah. a time. I've only want, met one person that has two Camaros. That's you. <laughs> that's so right. very that's, true, that's yeah. legendary. So, yeah. But, I mean, I think I remember gas went up to a dollar. And I was like, oh, the Camaros have to go. Uh. <laughs> so um, I bought, like, a Nissan Sentra. Mm. And that was quite a bit of a change. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I remember I gave it to my sister before I moved to, to New York because you don't need a car. So yeah. <laughs> Well, so now you, you said uh, you ate and you grew, though, right? So you guys had a garden? Like, do you have... Is it, my are you, my are, grandmother had a garden, but okay. she lived in San Diego. You meant you grew as humans. Yes, oh. exactly. <laughs> you eat, you grow. Food you and know. we grow the food. Okay, because I we know always, that... that yeah. We always grew something. We okay. had a little, like, patch of something, usually with, like, bricks around it and maybe, like, tomatoes and peppers and things like that. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, we ate a lot out of boxes and cans and... Um, it's just the way it, I think it was, this yeah. is like, you know, late seventies and eighties. It's like, you're going to just, it's very convenient. Sure. So, yeah. And out of the freezer, lots of things frozen. Yeah. So it's when Costco came to town, it was called oh. price club and you could buy like things just in large quantities and, and freeze it or whatever. It was just so much easier. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, 
uh, visiting my grandparents in San Diego. My grandmother actually came from a farm in the Midwest, and so she always had a garden. But I remember being very picky about, do we really have to have zucchini three times a day? (laughs) And then if you ever grow a zucchini or summer squash, you know there's a reason why you have it three times a day, Mm. because they multiply and they double in size overnight, and you just need to keep eating it as fast as possible. (laughs) Well, you do the spaghetti squash. There's so many different iterations of it, right? But there are only so many iterations of it, right? (laughs) (laughs) Especially when you're a kid. You're like, I just want a cheeseburger, you know, a McDonald's burger. Uh, So when did it change for you? Like, when did it change where it Um, became more serious? Well, my first job was at an Italian restaurant. This um, was the car funding job? Yes. Okay. It okay. really was yeah, the yeah. car funding because that was like the first year was, you know, I got got to buy a car, got to buy a car, got to yeah. buy a car, and, and I got a car. And then um, the next year, and I was a junior in high school, and the next year I was a senior in high school, and you had a little bit more of a pick of what uh, was available and jobs that were out there. And I got a job working at a restaurant called Cafe Terracotta, and it was a woman chef, and she she was the executive chef and owner, and then she hired a woman chef, chef de cuisine, and there were lots of women in the kitchen, and the restaurant I first worked for, I was the only woman in the kitchen, and I was working pantry, and I wasn't going to move up, and I mean, I realized that very early on, that I was staying where I was at. You were going to do pantry and desserts and make salads, and that was your job, yeah. and you would never move to a hotline. You would never move somewhere else, and I was like, well, okay, that was a good lesson to learn yeah. very quickly, Yeah, because I think a lot of people get stuck and have have come up and have been stuck in that spot, and and they maybe move to pastry or things like that, because that's where a woman in a kitchen would go. Yeah, um, but very much a ceiling of, of right. what you could do. And so I moved. Uh, I wanted to move to another restaurant, and it was, it was uh, fine dining, um, well-known. Um, this I worked, is in Tucson still? This is in Tucson. Okay, but yeah. she ended up, she and her husband opened a restaurant, a cafe terracotta up here in okay. Phoenix. And um, so I said, I, and I knew I wanted to get out of Tucson. I'm like, I got to get out of here. What am I going to do? It and, was small town back in that time, right? Like, yeah, you're talking um, late 80s. Yeah. So very small. Yeah. And I'm like, I have to get out of here. I still think it's small. <laughs> um, and uh, as soon as they opened the restaurant up here, I went to them and I said, I'd really like to be the chef. And they kind of looked at me like, she's got to be crazy because I was 20. And uh, they said, well, you could be the sous chef, but don't tell anybody how old you are. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> I came up here and was the sous chef. And um, and then moved up to be the chef de cuisine. And um, I worked for them for an ent- for six years. And they yeah. really taught me so much. I mean, I, I consider Donna definitely a mentor of mine. When you work for somebody from like 17 to 22, 23. Um, she took me to San Francisco. She took me to um, different uh, food cities and things like that. Really taught me about going out and trying different things. And yeah. even to the point where it's like, you know, where the fork is, put your napkin on your lap. Don't... I mean, when you're sitting at a table at home eating with your folks, it's like with paper and napkins, and all of a sudden you're eating in a restaurant that has a cloth <laughs> napkin, and you're just sitting there waiting. She's like, put the, put the napkin on your, on your lap. I'm like, okay. And I always, I have to say, I always think about it. It's like, as soon as I sit down, napkin goes on lap. It's like, yeah. that was something I was taught pretty much, you know, right away to, to do. And, uh, but then it was also just going out to eat and trying different things and being open-minded and having experiences. And yeah. I just kept following with that. Um, I met Krista Robertson from Rancho Pino uh, while I was actually still in Tucson at Cafe Terracotta. And she ended up leaving and going to L.A. Okay. and working for Nancy Silverton. And then she went to Napa and worked up there at a restaurant called Terra for Hero. And um, she and her husband came back and were getting ready to open up uh, Rancho Pino. And so like the first year they were at old, uh, they were in uh, town and country and uh very small and she they were thinking it was just one year they did that um before they moved to the scottsdale location that they had until she just closed recently but um i would go on my day off and and work with her and like chris bianco did her pastas and bread and he did that uh, station she did the grill station and she had a pantry cook it's like three little spots yeah and i would hang out once uh, a one day a week and then when she was planning on moving to Scottsdale, it was going to be a bigger operation. Uh, Bianco was going to take over the space and open up Pizzeria Bianco. And um, she asked if I would come. And so I said, you know, I've got to make this move. This is going to be better for me. This is like the type of restaurant I want to have. Yeah. Um, Cafe Terracotta had a POS system. They had, it was 300 seats. It was, while I learned so much there and really grew there, I knew that that wasn't the restaurant I was going to be opening. Okay, yeah. And you really need to... 
I think you have to work at restaurants that you see yourself eventually having and yeah. get that experience in. I mean, I was joking about it yesterday, but we don't even, we're just now getting a POS system in our restaurant here. Oh, really? <laughs> 12 years, and it's our gift that we're going to get a, we handwrite our tickets. And okay. uh, when anybody ever starts working here, they're like, so where's the, I mean, and I've had people in the kitchen, like, look around and they're like, there, where's a the ticket machine? And I was like, oh, we don't do ticket machines. It's all called. Yeah. And they're like, what? I mean, I've had them actually leave. Wow. <laughs> like, really? I'm, wow. I need a ticket machine. Yeah. And I was like, okay, ticket machine for you. But wow. I'm not. Even when we do it in the kitchen, we're still going to call it. But um, I just like it that way instead of everybody just staring at tickets. Uh, but and Why is that? Like, it, what, it, what does that add? Well, it's just, I mean, it has one person expediting uh, and everything just kind of coming together instead of maybe you read the wrong ticket or... Um, it's just how I, I ended up cooking like that in, in New York, where there's just one person expediting, one person yeah. calling everything out. Everything comes together. Uh, you're not standing there staring at tickets. And um, there's just advantages, I yeah. feel, to I, it. I would seem that there, there would be, for sure. Yeah. But I know Seems there like are, it creates an innate sense of communication in the kitchen as yeah, well. You have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you have to be like, and if you don't, and it does happen, where you're like, go ahead and pick up the, the person. Our, our expediter always... Um, is cooking as well. They're on the grill station. So all of a sudden they ask saute for a chicken though. And chicken can take 20 minutes. And you'd be like, and I've been on that station. I'm like, my, you didn't call a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> like, and they're like, just doing one of like, Oh, shit, oh yeah. Chicken. So oh, then chicken. it's the, we need to fix that. Um, if we're really busy, I'll just have an extra one fired during the p- busy spot. And then like at nine o'clock, just rotate that, make sure it's rotated. in. Mm-hmm. And so at least I covered, my, <laughs> covered myself because there isn't anything like, you know, oh, I have to pick up that chicken. I'm like, I don't have that chicken. That just is now going to take 20 minutes. Yeah, I think so. it fits. It, it, it fits the the whole brand itself too. The whole the whole um, just concept that you have here, right? Like, you know, yeah. I don't know. It seems it's very hands on, and it's very. Uh, I feel very at home here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Thank you. yeah. No, it is very hands on. I mean, Pavli and I. Uh, I mean, I'm here all the time, and and. Um, it was something that was said to me recently too, was about the fact that somebody at like my level, whatever that is supposed to mean, usually isn't, but guests have said this to me, you know, why are you in your restaurant if you're at this level? I was like, because I like being in my yeah. restaurant. Cause I don't cook on the line every night. Um, I did up until about four years ago. I wasn't, I wasn't on a station at all before COVID. And then that has changed because we are short staffed and it is yeah. what it is. And, I know my staff would rather not have me on a station at this point, but you got to get through. So yeah. I, I still do two or three shifts um, dinner service. And then actually something that's been a little different is we've been short in the front of the house. So I've been at the, at the door, which is the last place I ever thought I'd ever see myself <laughs> is greeting people. Um, Was that not one of the motivating things of getting in this industry is the greeting? Oh, I never, <laughs> it's never been motivating to be in the front of the house. It's nice to be in the kitchen. Sure. I mean, our kitchens have been open and you're definitely speaking to people and communicating but um and talking and chatting but uh you can usually kind of sneak away yeah. and you can't do that when you're at the front door yeah. greeting everybody <laughs> right. yeah. so the last that's been about the last two months now where we've um i've been in the front like on fridays and saturdays and uh it's interesting i mean there's yeah. sometimes where people just kind of just beat you down and then there's other times where i'm like wow they were just so nice tonight they yeah. were great this was wonderful yeah but, I had a day a couple of weeks ago where uh, that people just were not kind. And I was just like, I thought I, I'm going to have to come in the next day and just not speak to the staff just so that I don't like put out that negative energy that mm. I just kind of sucked up from, uh. from guests. And then I also just had to realize too, that I can't take that negative energy. You know, you just, you have to have this bubble around you and, um, and not let people get, get at you. So. Easier said than done, right? <laughs> Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because I yeah. own it, and somebody says they don't like something. And it's not that I don't like a, something or whatever. It usually has to do with our, our policy with vaccinations and um, that people will give us a harder time for. But, you know, I'm just like, it, it's the way it is. And yeah. I, have, I have to keep my staff safe. So um, I'm fine with whatever you say. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Does it get easier as years go on? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. it does. I yeah. mean, this was definitely a big bump in the last two years. Sure. So yeah. Definitely yeah. not expected. Definitely not what you're planning for. But I think 
you know, like we were just saying earlier about never kind of really, you go in on Tuesday and then, okay, this doesn't work or that doesn't work. And I, I'm not going to say that COVID was anything like that because it's still like whatever, but knowing that you always are moving around and adjusting in this sort of business, um, it was just where I was like, we have to adjust some more. We'll yeah. just adjust some more. We'll move the entire dining room outdoors for an entire season. Yeah. Uh, we'll just do takeout. I never thought we'd do takeout. We hmm. just did takeout. Yeah. Um, but it, it started bringing people, our employees back, you know, that needed to get back into work. Yeah. Um, we'll paint the entire restaurant. So somebody has a job that has never painted before, but <laughs> yeah. I I'll show they him. did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'll show him how to paint. I just remember going, okay, this is your job. You're going to paint the entire restaurant. And then he's like, can you show me how to do it? And I was like, wait, you don't know how to paint, but it's just like something I guess I took for granted that, you know, my father taught me how to do. It. And I was like, okay, this is how you paint and make sure everything's looking good. And yeah. So, you, know, just, you seem like a great leader, Charlene, for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you constantly are adjusting. I think a lot of that came from being in New York, too. I mean, I, I don't compare them to being uh, the same thing, but I opened a restaurant in the West Village um, six months before 9-11. And uh, you can't plan on something like that. Yeah. Having, you know, you can plan on, okay, maybe the stock market isn't going to do so well. Or that, yes, a recession, what could that do to your business? Or these things, you know, all sorts of things that you could think of, but I never would have thought that that would have happened. And then what the impact was on my business, Yeah, the fact that, you know, it was New York city and yeah, I'm trying to come back from something like that, but people just not going out, people not celebrating people, not, you know, you're, I'm thinking I'm going to have this business in the holidays. I'm going to have all of this and none of that happening. And then, um, by that spring we were, you know, going to war and people just sitting and watching TV and ordering Chinese food and not going out to dinner. And yeah. it took me the pretty much the entire time I was there. I had a restaurant for six years and it took me pretty much the entire time to recover from that. Within the, and it happened within, you said, the first six months? Six months. Yeah. I opened my restaurant in February and that happened in September. And then yeah. um, it took, because I just started like not, I mean, we just didn't do well after that. The best month I ever had was August. Yeah. <laughs> All these reviews coming yeah. in, everything's moving along and then it's not going well. And yeah. I was like, well, this is just a lesson. So, um, you know, with, with COVID happening, I was like, you just have to keep moving and see what works and figure it out. Yeah. And then also think about what your options are. Yeah. It made me think about that. I was like, okay, do you want to keep doing this? But I, you know, I, I know of at least two chefs and then myself included that's, you know, we signed another lease uh, during yeah. this period of time, it's like, yep, yeah, sign the lease. We're going to keep going. Just did it reinforce it? Did it reinforce it for you at all? Or was it just kind of business as usual? You know um, what I mean? No, it reinforced. I was like, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm just like, okay, this is why I can keep doing this. I can keep doing this yeah. because of my experiences. And I want to make sure that the staff has, you know, they're taking care of, not that they can't find another job. This isn't the end all. They will do to have other jobs in the future too. But, um, you know, it, we're also a big family, and it's just like, okay, I've had people that have worked here 11, 12, 9, 5 years, whatever, and, and uh, you know, I just want to make sure that we you know, we work and stay together, and, and uh, I can do, you know, give them a living wage, those things are, you know, and, and health insurance, and, you know, um, this summer, uh, we close for two weeks, which we haven't done in a really long time. We, we go down to four days a week in the summer just to basically consolidate our business. Um, this summer, we close for two weeks because I have all those full-time staff. And instead of, like, coming up short because somebody's on vacation the entire three months, and then it's, like, yeah. it's so hard to make up, or the guests are the ones possibly that suffer from that. I'm like, everybody's taking your time off. This is your vacation. This is when it's going to happen. Um, and we paid them for it, and it yeah. was... Uh, the first time we've ever been able to do that too. Nice. And um, I think the consolidating business uh, has made us not even just the four days, but working five days instead of six. And I've talked to other um, chefs and restaurateurs about it too. And I, it's made us a lot smarter Yeah. Yeah. and more efficient. And um, I'll be curious because this is the first year we've done that with the five days. I'll be curious after look at the taxes and see, how our expenses were when we're done with this year. And, and, um, I think it will show that we, we did a better job um, yeah. 
being more efficient and and making money and not working as hard. And then yeah. I'll probably just slap myself upside that head for <laughs> eleven years of of working six days. Be like, why do you think about this? Or you know, sooner. Well, it takes those years of of beating your head against <laughs> you know, like to be able right. to like, okay, all right, yeah. Now, okay, so I, Charlene, we could sit. I I can speak for both of us. We could sit here and talk for hours. We like so many paths we can go down, and, and we we want to have you on the show again as you know talking about fmb yep. but this is blue water mountain project right yes. let's let's jump because i know you got actually related uh, appointment in like 15 minutes or oh, so goodness, it yeah. is that soon. okay <laughs> so um so let's jump into blue water what what is that um well uh just right after the restaurant opened um i was approached by a uh, a vice principal of a school not too far from here in Scottsdale. It was a called, uh, the school's called Arcadia Neighborhood Learning Center, um, now called Echo Canyon. Uh, they changed the name a few years ago. But um, she came, she brought a little herb plant, she brought a letter, and it said, hey, we'd love to have you come to our school. We're starting this Chef in the Garden program. And, uh, and she was somebody who had eaten, she and her family had eaten at Rancho for quite a number of years, had started eating at F&B. And uh, so I knew her, and I said, yeah, I'd like to come. And she always jokes that I also mentioned to her that I don't really like children, but I would come anyway. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have any. I don't like them. But, yeah, I'll help you out. That sounds like a cool thing to do. Yeah. So I went, and then she always loves joking that the first thing I said to her after I was done was, when can I come back? Ah, mm. nice. Because I was like, oh, you hooked me. Yeah. Um, although I do remember after I finished, I was like, I, I need a drink. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it goes hand in hand, though, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, God bless teachers. I don't know how they do it for eight hours and I know they get their little breaks in between but um and for not a lot of pay either right like no that's, it's a, and I was beat I was like yeah. and there it still happens I'll go and do a couple chefs in the gardens and then I'm like I think I need to take a nap um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm only doing like maybe a couple of hours yeah when we first started though we were doing it during the during their lunch period which um is only 20 minutes and um we started getting into where we could do it for like their specials, their electives, and um, and then we could do it because we were trying to, and we still are doing that, trying to incorporate uh, curriculum, because yeah. then we can have more of their time if you're actually making it into a lesson that involves something they're supposed to be learning. Like third graders need to be learning about Arizona and mm. what happens in Arizona. So you tie Arizona. And I bring a, a sheet tray full of citrus, and. It has four different kinds of grapefruits and three different kinds of lemons and two different kinds of limes and you know, five different kinds of oranges, blood oranges and tangerines and all that. I can, first of all, teach them like a compare and contrast. And then I also like to get them to formulate their own opinion by deciding what they like and don't like instead of deciding that their neighbor is going to tell them what they like and don't like. But then we can talk about citrus and Arizona and geek out about the five C's and things like that and tie it into what is a lesson and their teacher's really excited because the last thing I ever want to do when I do one of these um, is make more work for a teacher. They already mm. have enough work and I never want them to see that I'm coming in to make more work for them. Yeah. I want it to be where they feel like I'm adding to something like that and the, and the kids all got fed and so do the teachers and everybody else that's walking around. Yeah. Um, and this was all at Echo Canyon and what I wanted to do was I wanted to see this happen at like every school and I still want to but we're like still pushing that along. Um, but we, um, I went and did a program for the James Beard Foundation that they had called a, a boot camp and they would take 12 chefs and take you to a farm and we went to Shelburne Farms in Vermont um, and we did it, and, and being a boot camp, like we literally got, literally got there Sunday afternoon from all over the country, these 12 chefs, I was one of them. And I did this in 2015, and um, we kind of like met, started chatting, talking about things, policy change, things like that. They want to kind of educate you. They want to tell you how much it means for um, your community to really make an impact. Um, and then they also just kind of want to give you the tools in order to help you get further along with whatever you're trying to do, which I was trying to get more chefs in schools and talking about food and gardening and all of those things. So um, uh, I came back here, and, you know, this program they were doing was 12 chefs three times a year. There was a wait list of, like, 800 chefs wanting wow. to do this. So, And some of the other chefs here in town have done it. Daniel Leone did it. Um, Sasha Raja from uh, 24 Carats did it. Um, cause they would ask for recommendations as well. And anybody, and this could. is a learning experience for you. Yeah. Not, not like you're teaching someone else when you No, get there. you're sitting like classroom style all day, Monday, mm -hmm. like 8am 
to like 5 p.m., a little lunch break. Um, they do a little tour because they know what the chefs do they, that were bouncing all over the place. <laughs> they gave us one time like these little things to play with with our hands, and I was like, I had a pile of them by the time we were done. Because <laughs> you are, you're, want, you're antsy, you're moving around a lot. They do try to get you moving around, but they're really trying to like get something, get something, you know, the, the point across, um, whether it's SNAP, whether it's sustainable seafood, whether it's composting and, and sustainability, whether it's what's happening in our school lunch programs. And that's what our, mine was about too. So it was a really great tie in to what I was trying to do. Um, but I asked them to come out uh, at the time, the person who was leading the advocacy for um, the Beard Foundation, I asked her if she would come out and kind of do a workshop here in Arizona for us. So she did. Nice. We did it here. We did it for a day. Same thing, eight to five, lunch break in between, um, and just talking about what's happening in Arizona, what's happening in lunchrooms, what's happening in gardens, what's happening, um, and the differences we can make. And we started, we started meeting after that. We did a fundraiser, real quick fundraiser, um, uh, the first one was like in October, then we've moved it to January now, um, and we've incorporated students into it as well, and we just, we came up with a name, Blue Watermelon Project, we just pieced it together, it's been rolling, you know, rolling along all these years, and this this is the first year we've able, we received a grant from the Steel Foundation, we were able to hire somebody because... Um, the only person keeping it organized, unorganized was me. And that wasn't very good. Um, and only on Sundays and Mondays. Right. So, well, I have to say that the person we hired pretty much had to pull everything apart in the last six years and then mm -hmm. just been piecing it all back together. It's under the umbrella of slow food Phoenix. Um, okay. one of the suggestions that, um, Catherine, who was the person running the, um, uh, advocacy program at, for the Beard House said, you know, don't start another nonprofit. There's lots of them that need somebody to kind of breathe some life into it. And that's what, you know, I think we did. And because yeah. um, the Slow Food Phoenix chapter now is just amazing. I mean, and they're working on so many other projects as well. And, you know, we came in and and just kind of started getting it going and, and it brought, you know, attracted other people to join. And um, it's, it's cool what's happening now with that. And, uh, and then we're able to kind of match up with people from ASU, the sustainability program, other schools that have similar ideas. There's a lot of places um, and nonprofits that are doing very similar things. Okay. And so it's really great, I mean, to partner with them and to really make things happen. And we're getting ready to do our next fundraiser. We weren't able to do one. We did it January 2020 before everything fell apart. We obviously didn't do one last year. Yeah. Um, we're going to do one. January 22nd, uh, 2020, 2022. And, uh, it's a lot of like twos, ones, twenties, and I know this one's going to be a lot of twos. <laughs> um, but what we do is, um, we, we call it feeding the future. Um, and we have teams that are created at schools. Um, I have, I have three different schools myself and Doug Robson is kind of heading the Chandler group with, um, uh, some other chefs that are working with a lot of the schools there. Um, and there's other chefs that are working all over the place. Uh, depending on the age group, high school students have to create an entire tray. And they're doing this within the, the, the boundaries of what, and they get a little bit more of the boundary, um, but they get $1.50 to create the entire tray, which is more than probably the high school, wow. um, you know, the food service coordinator would have that opportunity. It's usually a dollar. And, that, and that's to kind of highlight that, like the, what, what they're working with? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they're, it's, it's to help them be creative. We use, uh, you know, we have them, uh, they're usually culinary students um, at that level. Um, middle school is coming up with either a breakfast or a, um, a snack, an afternoon snack. Um, and then the elementary schools are coming up with either a fruit or vegetable combo. Oh. And um, one or the other, like basically the side dish. Yeah. And you have to follow all the rules. I mean, this morning I was with my middle school, and, and they're doing f uh, fruit skewers, and they want to have bacon on their fruit skewer, and it's a really cool idea, and I'm like, super excited about it. But when I told them, I said, you know, you have to serve breakfast with two ounces of grain. So what are we serving for our grain? And I start bringing out, I brought a little sun butter sandwich I made for them. I brought a thing of uh, cereal, cold cereal. I bought some oatmeal. Um, and I brought some blueberry muffins. And they were like, what's the cereal for? And I said, well, we have to decide what we want to match up with this. We want to, do you want a taste test? Do you want to decide? And they all want blueberry muffins, which was what I was hoping for. <laughs> I, was really, I was really hoping for the blueberry muffin because I wanted to tie it into a project that um, uh, Tamara and I were able to work with the Arizona Department of Education um, this, this year. 
um, and uh, bringing recipes to um, using indigenous ingredients. And blue corn, uh, a blue corn blueberry muffin was something that we created. Ooh, yeah. And uh, I have this... I have this idea that I'll, because what we do is then the chef is going to turn around and make this dish in, a, you know, a little bit of a tweak, but we'll make this dish for the guests and there's probably going to be 200 of them. So um, we'll do like a mini skewer because there's going to, right now we have 16 teams and okay. so 16 bites of of all sorts of um, items. and so That I'm goes thinking, quick. It's like a beer fest, right? You get 20 <laughs> tickets. Those 20 tickets go quick. Right. Um, but you walk around, you'll get your little skewer, and I want to I wanna have the little um, blueberry blue corn muffin. And then I, wa- I, you know, I want to be able to have, I've been talking to them, I want to be able to showcase the blue corn. Ooh, where yeah. it's, you know, it's from Arizona. What's this about? It's actually in schools, um, how the recipe maybe was developed. And... Uh, they were the middle school was the boys were really excited about it. Yeah. And then um, elementary school, they're working on a potato turnip roasted um, dish, and other ones are working on oranges because they're local with a strawberry sauce and yeah. uh, so creative. And the other ones are working on carrots with a, a dip that has applesauce in it, and, and yeah. um, That's it's a cool. lot of fun. So that that is the lead up to the the event on January twenty second. Right. Yeah. We we yeah. go and work with the students and have them. Uh, develop their recipes yeah. and then w- it has to go into uh, a google doc that actually puts everything together it tells you because like right now my high school um is short 100 calories because they have to stay within nutritional guidelines oh, too wow. they're yeah. short 100 calories they're 10 cents over and i think the fat wasn't right but the fat would if they bring the calories up the fat should adjust itself but yeah. they're already 10 cents over so <laughs> it's taking something out that's maybe costing too much, adding something that costs a little bit less, and also yeah. bringing the nutrition up. And I was like, can't wait to hear what we've done this yeah. week. <laughs> that's um, interesting. And we try I to like give that. them, you know, we, we met with the teacher a couple of weeks ago before break, and, um, and we said, okay, if you take out, because it's just this back and forth, take out a, take out a fish stick, because they're doing a fish taco. Take out a fish stick, maybe add a bean, which the nutrition level could be higher. The cost would be less. Maybe add a nut here. Um, that depending on the cost and stuff, we were working out different parts yeah. could also bring up the, the calories, the fat down, the cost down. It's, it, uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Yeah. They also put sour cream in two things. And I was like, there's no way in the lunchroom at a high school, there's going to be sour cream. In two <laughs> items. They're not going to let you do it. It sounds great. I'm yeah. like, do it when you're in your classroom. Yeah. It's not going to happen in the lunchroom. Too much of a high end product for the, it's for the... It will that and the fat con. I mean, it oh, could okay. be low fat sour cream, but it is costly. Okay. Yes. A lot of times you'll yeah. see something like that in a pack as, as a possibility that they could grab it if they want it, but uh, um, not, not going to be on everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's interesting though, right? Because it, 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 it uh, forces that attention to detail of mm-hmm. like, uh, there's more to it. Like it's, it's a more careful approach right. to it. Right. Which is on a very micro level when you're looking at a cer- certain dish, but that can expand so much. Right. right. And yeah. So, but, uh, as chefs, whether it's me or Amber or Doug or Carlos or all these chefs, Butch that are all working with these students, you know, we come from the background. Yeah. We have to have food cost and we have to, but we're not counting calories and yeah. we're not, and you obviously want to keep then a food cost, but not a food cost that's that low. And yeah. really, will it, it opens your eyes and it makes you um, just appreciate. You know, I think people come across as wanting to, um, you know, I want to change school lunch and, and this is all wrong and that's all wrong. But in, if you haven't been in those shoes or seen how difficult it is, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you got to back it up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, <laughs> you just don't have, you're not in a position to, to really be criticizing not knowing that and then on top of it this year i've just had to watch the the supply chain issues are Mm. for real if a school doesn't get uh like their milk delivery and they have to have you have to serve school lunch with milk i mean you are in trouble because you're not following the guidelines Uh, of the national school lunch program and uh that's it, it, they don't just like give you a pass, right? Right. <laughs> your milk didn't show up. Nah, that's okay. Great. So Find your, some milk. Yeah. Go to the store. Get whatever it is. Well, now yeah. you're not paying for it, or it's not a commodity. Yeah. Um, and it's costing you more money that you didn't have. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. They just have someone at the end of the line pouring cups of milk out of a jug, huh? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know it was record. Like you have to have milk. You have with, to have milk on yeah. the lunch tray. Yes, wow. Absolutely. 
That's crazy. Well, so, so um, if, if I'm capturing it right, uh, Blue Watermelon is you go into the schools and, and really finding students who want to take, have a future in the culinary arts. Or, or I mean, they may not at like fifth grade level sure. or sixth grade, but the high school students are all pretty much in culinary, whether okay. they're in a, a CCAP program, the Career Through Culinary Arts program, or they're okay. through, in EVIT, which is also getting you, um, you know, into hospitality and yeah. a, a high school program like that. Um, I was in a program called FEAST, um, which is food education and service training and uh, I like that. that was a good yeah. one. That's a good acronym. <laughs> there you go. Um, and it still exists. I just went to my high school like two months ago, and I was like, is that a feast, Chef Coat? <laughs> wow. They got their own Letterman jackets yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I was like, that's, that's awesome. And I'm like, I'm glad it's still alive. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, it's it takes the teacher to really be helping out with this because um, – my high school class for a while has been after school, so um, it's a little different that we're doing it. We're doing it between lunch break now. Yeah. But um, that's a teacher that's giving up a lot of extra time, and yeah. most of these are. The one I'll see in the uh, – from my, my middle school has been during class, but um, my – Elementary school's been an, after, an hour after school. Okay. And that's a teacher, that's two teachers that, it's a teacher and a food service coordinator that are not getting extra pay for this. Yeah. They're doing it in the kindness of their heart. Yeah. Which is yeah. hard to find a lot right now. Sure. <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm like, man, you guys are amazing. Yeah. Well, so, okay, so then, so you go into school and, and you've, you've got the people, the, the kids that are part of the program. Is it, then is it with the intent of being like more mindful or more deliberate with like, uh, what is the, what is the, I guess, encapsulating thing that you're trying to teach the kids? Um, it, a lot of things. I mean, whether it is um, being mindful about the person who is feeding you in the lunchroom, okay. get, coming up with some different ideas too. The winner gets their lunch uh, served in their, their cafeteria. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's really yeah, cool. That is cool. And, um, and gets to kind of show, show that off. But I think, again, we all think it's like easy to make this change and to have a, a young mind, a high schooler, even younger, be able to see that it's not that easy. Yeah. Um, is to me, I think is, is where the change will happen. Yeah. You know, that's, that's where to start thinking about making the change is thinking about this isn't that easy. This isn't, um, that you're just not going to snap fingers and have things show up or, or how do you put that together? This is, you know, we give them a list. This is what you get to work with yeah. and this is what you can choose from. This is how much it's going to cost. And, um, and they learn from that. And then they also learn cause that we ask them to try it out with their friends and maybe they learn that this isn't something that their friends really enjoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I've worked with other teams in past years and, and I've even said to them, this is, um, you know, this is probably not going to win. Uh, this is a little too, you know, making a, making a chicken parm, it's not going to, to win. Yeah. You need to think about this a little bit more. And interestingly enough, I, I mean, I also start with parties, I mean, with uh, teams that maybe have three or four students in it. And I've had like the one, the last two winners of the grand prize, and they win $5,000 scholarship to their school. Um, Sprouts actually donates that. And um, when they go to uh, college, um, they've ended up dropping out. And I said, well, you, where was your friend? And they weren't helping me. So I, ah. I dropped them. So mm. wow. It's good, good lessons to learn in high school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, absolutely. if someone's not pulling their weight, yeah. then, Later. you know, and if, and if it's going to cost $5,000, you know, and then, yeah. uh, second place is 3000 and third place is 2000. And, uh, Jason from Noble Bread donates, um, that wow. for the scholarships. And then we just literally cut a check to the school, um, the first place from two years ago, she's at uh, NAU, and, and yeah, you just write a check, put yeah. their student number in, and that's awesome. pays for something. Yeah. And uh, because they thought about, you know, how important it is about how how they're eating, you yeah. know, and what they're eating, and those are all things I think that we want to make sure they're thinking of and being creative. And it, I think it just covers a lot of a lot of things that can, again, at the end, be a result about making a change. Um, whether it's for themselves or, you know, I'd love to see more people getting into food service um, with schools and, uh, you know, just thinking about maybe instead of a restaurant, it's another option. Yeah, yeah. Well, Charlene, like I said, we could keep going. I know <laughs> you've got this call. We don't want to keep you from that. Thank you so much for this. Thank uh, you. Yeah, so January 22nd, tickets are still available. Yes. Where do people go to, to get the tickets? Um, it is on Eventbrite, but okay. you can go I mean, you can go to a link that is through Slow Food Phoenix. Uh, okay. It's on our Instagram. Okay. Um, it'll take you right to the Eventbrite page uh, where we're selling them. What um, is the name of the event? If people can just Google it. It should be Blue Watermelon Project. 
yeah, that should. There it is. Right Boom. Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm um, feeding the future. Okay. Is also that usually pops up there too. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So can't wait to uh, get you back on again. Oh so. yes. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Bye.